So welcome everyone. Uh, welcome today's Council on Foreign Relations meeting with Brazil's Central Bank Governor, Roberto Camponeto. Now this meeting is part of the C. Peter McCulloch series on international economics. I'm John Lipsky, Senior Fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, SICE, and I'll be presiding at today's session. We're joined today by uh, CFR members attending here in person, as you can see, but also uh, virtually via Zoom. So we will have uh, time. It, it, the, the governor is going to make some remarks. Then we will have time. We, he and I will have some discussion, as is typical in this format. And then we will take questions from the floor and also from uh, participants on Zoom. And um, before, I, before we, I invite the governor to uh, join us, two things. First, I'm told by uh, council staff that as near as they can tell, this is the first visit of a Brazilian central bank governor to the Council on Foreign Relations. So I'd say, so the moment is historic. Thank you. Second, uh, you will find, of course, a biography of the, of the governors. Perhaps you hopefully have already read it, very impressive, and I assume all correct. Mine is there, it's not all correct. <laughs> <laughs> I was not the first deputy <laughs> managing director of the IMF from 2006 to 2020. It stopped after my five-year term in 2011. So just to clarify that. Now, I don't want to embarrass the governor before we call him up here, but I'm, I'm going to risk it by showing, to, in case you didn't know, here is Latin finance naming the governor, the central bank governor of the year at the time of the annual meetings uh, last year. And uh, it contains such uh, reference as citing his adroit management of monetary policy to bring down inflation as a main reason why his performance was by far the best of any central bank governor in Latin America and the Caribbean. And this, and this in a period in which the uh, challenges for central bank governors have not been, have not been trivial. Now, uh, Proceeding, by the way, uh, this session is on the record, and uh, this will, when, uh, when we come to Q&A, keep that in mind. Now, I'm going to invite the, the governor here. He's got a presentation to share about uh, that I think you're going to find of great interest, and then we'll have a discussion. Governor, welcome. Now, history will be made. <laughs> My mic, my mic is working here, right? Actually, I was told to talk about the uh, innovation. So um, some of you, like Harry, will be kind of bored. But we, we, I can answer your questions after that. Uh, and uh, we have, we've done a, an extensive agenda of innovation. Uh, it's uh, in the fifth year now, going to the sixth year. And it's amazing the, the things that the central bank had been had be doing in the past and what we have been able to add on the top of it. But the, the, the first thing that we did when we were thinking about what would be the financial intermediation of the future was really ask the question, what is it going to look like? And uh, we had in mind that would be much more digital, but we don't know by, we didn't know by how. We had in mind that you'd have more and more digital property and digital assets, but we really didn't know how that would evolve. And we knew that it, the only way to include people, to be inclusive and sustainable, was to add more technology. A lot of the, um, the lower uh, population, population of lower income, were not included because they had such a small ticket and such a small uh, participation that without, without technology, would, we wouldn't be able to include them. So the idea is we wanted to have something that was competitive, generated competition, lower the barrier of entry for smaller banks and smaller companies uh, that was inclusive, inclusive and sustainable. So the first thing that we ask ourselves is, you know, we are in this digital uh, world transformation. 
And uh, in reality, people are looking for a representation, a digital representation of an asset of some form. And basically what you see, uh, what we see happening is people get an asset, put an encryption around it, and then put on, a, on some kind of platform, uh, blockchain platform uh, or ledger. Uh, and that has become much more efficient. And we have a lot of things that tells us that this is more efficient. And so the, the real question was not a, whether crypto is good or bad, or we believe in crypto, it's more thinking that, are we moving into a tokenized economy? That was the, the main question. And the answer is yes, we think we are moving into a tokenized economy. It's happening. Uh, it's actually happening in some parts faster than we expected, and some other parts are, are happy, happening slower. So um, I would go to this graph. This is probably a summary of everything that we are doing in five years. So you can get five years in one graph here. The idea is, how can I make that change? The first thing we needed to know, we needed to do, is we needed to have this rail of payments or any kind of rail in, react, in, in which actually people were engaged and people would be able to see uh, the advantage, uh, that their lives are becoming easier, the, 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 cheap, the, the cost of transactions becoming uh, uh, lower and more efficient. And at the time, we were looking at the kinds of payments and exchange of values that were happening. And we look a lot at gamers. Uh, gamers, you know, are doing a lot of transactions through uh, kind, of, uh, kind of blockchain uh, formats. And there was a lot of monetization of scores in gaming. And all the surveys that we looked at is what do you look in in a, in, a, in a payment system. And there was always five things that happened. They wanted to be fast, cheap, transparent, secure, and open. This is basically what people are looking at. So we said we need to um, start our, you know, our journey uh, engaging people. And then uh, we developed PIX, which is an instant payment uh, that, that, that has reached reach wide, uh, very wide usage. We just broke record three days ago. We did 201 million transactions in one day. Uh, if you look at the bankerized population of Brazil, it's around 103, 104 million. So it's more than one transaction per person per day. So if you compare with UPI of India, for example, and, and, you, and you look at per capita, it's uh, between three and four times more. And it's a much newer system. So it really had a very wide uh, usage. Um, but the, the biggest thing when constructing the PIX, uh, which I think was, was, was not there in some of these other things, is how can we integrate PIX to this idea of tokenization? Well, it needed to be programmable. That was the main thing. So if you look at UPI, or if you look at some of the white papers that I've seen for, for, for systems in other places, they are non-programmable. And what's the problem of having an instant payment that is non-programmable? It's a big problem because if you have a digital currency, you're not going to be able to interact the digital currency uh, with the, the instant payment in a very efficient way. Plus, when you have a programmable rail, you can add new features. Uh, and actually, when we started doing PIX, we knew how it, how it would start, but we didn't know how it would end. And we, are, we keep adding new features into PIX. And you can solve a lot of the day-to-day -day problems just by understanding how programmable it can be. So that was the first part. The second part was, OK, uh, and I, I would refer back to a presentation that I did in 2019. And people actually thought it was a joke. I had this question saying, what is the fastest way to transfer 1 million pounds from Sao Paulo to London? And one of the, it was a multiple choice question. And one of, one of the answers was by plane. So people thought that was a joke. That was actually the fastest way to transfer the money. right? So we had at the time Swift, which was T plus two. And, and so when we look at what we have done, ours, uh, our environment, our you know, ecosystem, we haven't been able to evolve a lot on transferring on cross-border. You have some systems now that are working well. There is a system called Nexus that is linking India to Singapore and some other places, and it's working well. But we don't have a wide system of cross-border transfer. And actually, if we did have, um, it would make a lot of things much easier. You reduce the friction in trade, um, and we would actually solve a lot of the problems that we're having today. I still see a lot of debates on 
what is the currency of the future, whether the dollar will prevail, the renminbi will prevail. Well, guess what? If you have an instant payment system globally that settles instantly, the, the, the currency doesn't matter anymore, right? It's a digital token that matters. So when you talk about, when you talk about uh, this, uh, we go into the, the debates that we had at the BIS. And the debates were, okay, this is very difficult to do. Why? And we had three problems to solve. The first one is we needed a system. And when you talked about the system, the thing is you need to have a system to, that worked well and it was very scalable. You would need a system that would do well, not only between DLT to DLT, but also to centralize systems to DLT. And we could, at, at the time, that was two years ago, at that time you had good systems from DLT to DLT, but if you were to transfer DLT to, in, to centralized systems, because you have a recursive effect on the DLT platform to expose all the nodes, it would, become not, it would not become scalable. So, okay, that was a big problem. We had the technology, but we couldn't link systems of different characteristics. Well, that was solved. Uh, now you have these systems that the people call containers, which basically can link anything and it's just as fast and it's just as scalable. So the second problem is, okay, now we have the system. It's very easy to do a digital transfer, but we need to do the settlement. So we didn't know how to do the settlement. And so it, 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 it so happens that we now have a solution for that too. You can have the liquidity token pools. So the central banks will have tokens that were deposited in some kind of pool and we can do uh, instant uh, settlement even during the weekend. So that is now possible too. But then came the third problem, which we haven't solved, which in the beginning for us was, was we considered to be the easiest. And now we realize it's the most difficult, which is the governance. So for example, when you look at the AML and everything that relates to know your client and so on and so forth, every country has a different way of seeing it. Now, if you're gonna have a system that links everybody instantly, it's very difficult for us to have monitoring of what you know, happens in every uh, point of the transaction. So that's one dimension of the government problems. The second one is taxes. So depending on the country, you pay taxes, uh, depending on whether you're foreign or, or you're citizen, depending on your company or your person. So different countries have different tax regulations. And when we connect the system, the system won't be able to interpret that because it's very fast, it's instant, and you have millions and billions of transactions. And the third part, which became obvious when you started the conversation, is what we call the liquidity gates. So would you be, if you're a government, would you be comfortable with a citizen of your country saying, you know what? I think I want to get all my money out of this bank, and I just want to buy a CD from an Australian bank and I just wanna move all my liquidity there. What happens if the system has the ability of move, moving huge pools of liquidity instantly? So that was the third problem. So we are working on the governance. This is part of the work that we are doing in the G20. Okay, so I talked about the peaks, I talked about the international, internationalization of the currency. But then probably the biggest, the most important block of these four is the open finance one. Because now we have a rail and we are trying to internationalize the rail. But for this rail to actually have advantage for people, you need to have a place in which you can compare data from your bank accounts, from the products that you consume, the financial products. And the idea here is that you wanna have an environment in which you can have instant comparability and portability. So you don't wanna have one app of every bank in your cell anymore. You wanna have access to some kind of marketplace and you can migrate all your data to that marketplace and you can do instant comparability and portability of products. And with that, you reduce a lot um, the, 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 the cost of entry and also you're gonna have better products, more tailor-made for you. And then the, the, the end, the last, the last part of it is the DREX, which is the digital currency, uh, which in our case, um, and it's a long explanation, a long process, but when we had the debate on the digital currencies, <clears throat> but mostly the problem around build, building a digital currency is what happens when you have a digital currency that influences the asset liability aspect of the balance sheet of the central bank? That's a problem, right? And at the end, if I have that, nothing guarantees me that as people exchange more and more, 
I won't be eroding the ability of banks to do credit. So that needed to be fixed. And we had endless, we had endless debates at the BIS on how to fix that. And a lot of ideas came around. One was we want to limit the ability in which people can exchange money. And I thought at that time, this idea is not so good because imagine if I tell you that it's, it, the value can be converted back at any time at par, obviously it becomes a game theory um, thing and you can go, at, go there if you are informed and you can exchange more. And at the end, imagine myself going to Congress, explaining to Congress people that the people who had the information had exchanged all the money first and now they have a money that trades at premium. Impossible to explain that. Then people said, but we can do negative interest rate on that so that we can equate demand and supply. And immediately in my head was like, imagine calibrating interest rate every day to make demand equal to, I mean, this is impossible. So that question was not answered and it's still not answered. In Europe, for example, you have a limited amount of money that you can transfer. And we thought at the time there was a much easier to, a way to solve this problem. What if the money, the, the digital money is a token deposit. So the banks will block a deposit and issue a token on that. Now, if I do that, then the banks don't get disintermediated. And it has a lot of uh, dimensions of facilities that the other proposal doesn't have. I will concentrate on three here. First one, the complexity of building regulation around a new digital money is very difficult. But if it's just a tokenized deposit, it inherits all the regulation from deposits, and this is already done. Uh, so we don't need to go to Congress and pass different laws. And that becomes very easy. The second aspect of it is once I insert the, the tokenization concept into the balance sheet of the banks, they become much more efficient because they will start looking at asset liabilities in a token base, not in an account base. And there has been many pilots that have shown that this increases efficient efficiency in asset management, in risk management, in funding, in management of collateral, and so on and so forth. And the third dimension, which is particularly important in Brazil, is that we have this huge friction of contracts and registration. So if you buy an apartment in the US, you probably uh, have experience to the fact that you have to have a screw account. Then you have to have a lawyer on one side, a lawyer on the other side. Sometimes, and that actually happened to me, um, you need to have an agent that controls the screw account. In Brazil, if you buy a property, you need to register, and it's very expensive. Uh, depending on the value of the property, can go, you know, as a, a very relevant percentage. And if you have everything controlled on a GLT platform, the only thing you need to have your contract and registration is a printer at home, because everything is there and it's very transparent. Also, if you wanna use your asset against a loan, the divisibility is immediate, it's transparent. You can control the divisibility and you can see everything in a much more transparent way. So you have a lot of improvement in the friction that we have today in doing business. So that's um, the last part of it. So we close this, uh, this idea with something that I have extensive rail. I can internationalize the rail. I can have it in a way that people will start thinking about uh, banking in these uh, marketplaces of finance, the style of marketplace of finance. And then the two things that we still have not solved, which is how can I use all the data that I produce to actually make people's life better? So that comes uh, the idea of inserting block, uh, blocks of artificial intelligence into the process, into the marketplace. And this is something that we're examining now. And the second part, which is we haven't solved this, we haven't solved the data monetization. Today, we produce a lot of data. Uh, if you think in, in a way of savings, you almost like have a savings account that the data that you produce all, you know, all throughout your life, but you're never able to monetize that. So the idea is how the, the, the marketplace can actually collect data in a way in which you can exchange that for tokens. So I, I gave a pretty good picture. I only have 15 minutes. I want to pass to the, the main concept. So I have talked about that. So this is a little bit the difference between PIX, what happened to PIX and other countries. And you can see here how intensive the adoption of PIX was compared to other places. I can, we can see the growth. Uh, we can see that uh, 
we have been going to higher tickets to smaller tickets so more and more people are using on a daily life. Um, I like the graph on the right, which basically shows that as we introduce peaks, you had millions and millions of banks, bank accounts are open, which means that the peaks actually bunkerize people. Today, you can have uh, you know, people asking for money on the streets and accepting peaks in Brazil, and it happens uh, quite often, actually. Um, it, it, and, and you have all the collateral things. So uh, a lot of people send peaks of one cent to each other because they want to make sure they read the message, right? And so we had this boyfriend-girlfriend effect in which one would send, you know, would send a, a pix of a very low value because you know that when someone is sending money to you, you want to know, you know, you want to know. So we have these uh, externalities. Uh, so we have 71.5 million new users included with pix. I won't have time to go to all the functionalities, but you know, because the system is programmable, you can do a lot of things. Now we're going to a phase of uh, installing the automatic picks, which is basically if you have like a Netflix or, um, or a Spotify kind of bills that you have to pay every month, you can program everything in picks. Um, we wanna eventually do the reverse, which is the blocking of the transaction because then picks will be able to do the same function as a credit card does today but with much less friction. So we can do that also on the platform. Um, I already talked about the internationalization. And I will, oh, these are interesting numbers. We had more than uh, <clears throat> 68 billion API calls. That's people actually calling a bank to get information into another bank. So today in Brazil, even though we don't have those marketplaces of finance yet, what you can do is you can call a bank and ask for transfer information and you can compare the information on the platform of a third bank. So you can do that already. Uh, actually, there's a challenge of uh, having homogeneous data, but we are, we are working on that. We are also extending that concept to, um, to capital markets. So CVM is working on what we call the open capital markets. I already talked about the Drex a lot. This is how Drex would look into the balance sheet. Um, it's pretty basic, like I said, it's a bank that blocks a deposit, issues uh, a token on the deposit. Um, it's a wholesale operation, but it's also a retail operation because people can use it on a daily basis. And you can clear everything in the same platform that today we clear deposits. So it's pretty easy. Um, this is the schedule. And I, I will try to focus on this. This is what a marketplace would look like. So you would have one app. You'd go to your app and you have bank A, B, and C. And imagine you want to you know, pay something on the street. So you press PIX. Um, you can choose whether you want to do debit or credit. If you want to do debit, it shows the balance of your banks. If you want to do credit, it's going to show you the, the credit line that you have in every bank. And the banks will compete for that transaction online. And you have a lot of recursive uh, algos that will do that. If you have equity uh, uh, and you have the custody of bank A, all of a sudden you can get a message from bank B saying, you know what, I can do cheaper for you. And you can transfer just by pressing the button. So that's instant comparability and portability. You can switch between the digital money and the physical money there. Um, you have the open finance in which you can arrange the way you want to see data. And today, when you talk to investment bankers, they, they sell this product to clients called cash management. So basically, here you can do cash management for anybody for free because it's, it's done digitally. Um, I already talked about artificial intelligence. I think I think for now, that's it. I wanted to give you a clear picture. Thank you. I can help you. I don't know why. That's why you work out for. Man, many talent. <laughs> okay. So you can ask questions about anything. <laughs> well, first we're gonna. I want to ask a few clarifying things about this, and then we'll move on. I'll bet there are lots of questions about all kinds of things. Thanks very much. Uh, has everybody got all that clear? <laughs> Heads aren't spinning yet. The uh, let me ask just a few clarifying questions because it's really really impressive. Pix is phone based, essentially, or computer based. How do you how do you access if you're the individual? Yeah, Pix Pix was. Um programmed in the central bank, but we have a standardization in which every bank offers in the platform by obligation. So when you enter in the app of your bank, 
there's going to be a function called PIX, and then you can make the, the transfer. And, and the, by, by construction, PIX is free for everybody. So the banks cannot charge for PIX. They can charge for companies, but they cannot charge for individuals. Mm -hmm. But it has to be, it's through banks. It's through banks. through banks. Through banks, yes. It's not like Alipay. No, 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 it's through banks. It's yeah. a bank, yeah. bank, completely bank-based yeah. Well, you always have to move the money from one account to the other. So all the systems out there have to have an account of exit and account and an account that is recipient of the money. PIX is the same. So to use the system, you have to have an account have in it. a bank. And that's why I showed the graph of people. Uh, there yeah. were more than 12 million bank accounts are open because of that. And is is that system, it, well, you just said it, it's expanding. It, it really wasn't necessarily designed to be uh, like in India or like in uh, Kenya, a, a very, an extremely simple system. What you've described is something that will become very sophisticated, right? Yeah, I think India had a different purpose from the very, first India did it much before we did. Yeah. And then they had a different purpose. They wanted, the system was designed because they wanted to digital, digital, digitalize government services. And they wanted to have a digital ID. Exactly. So the focus of the system was not being programmable or interacting with tokens. Exactly. It was more, I want to make sure that people have a cheaper access uh, to government services through a platform. Our design was completely different. Yeah. Our design was looking at the digitalization of the financial intermediation. But you say it's going to be, it already has been and will be useful in terms of let's, uh, financial inclusion. Yes, yes. And you expect it to be quite broad. Yes. And we are seeing that because you have a lot of different businesses that only exist because of PICS. I can give you many examples, like during the pandemic, people were uh, manufacturing masks at home and the, the unit value of a mask is very low. So if you had to pay for the transfer, you would be able to do that. But because trans piece, uh, PIX is free for everybody, we had a lot of people who lived off producing things of very small value. So a lot of new business model came around. Mm -hmm. Then on the internationalization, Part of the problem, of course, is essentially know your customer, mm -hmm. anti-money laundering, financial mm -hmm. stability. Is that still a work in progress? Yeah, so it's a very good question. We are trying to, to see if we can make that a deliverable in the G20. I have, I'm working on that with uh, the president of the Central Bank of Italy, Fabio. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we had was, why don't we have a general taxonomy for international transfers. So you're gonna have a, a, you know, a group of regulation that you must uh, be, uh, um, uh, you must conform to that if you wanna participate in the group of banks or, or countries that will uh, join the project. Um, and the idea is talking to different countries and see if we can get like you know, 15 or 20 countries with this um, common taxonomy, I think the others will join. The more, the more complex things, when I talk to countries, is when they need to change the tax system because tax, changing tax system requires sending a bill to Congress. And some countries said, I really want to join the project, but to change the tax system. But I think if this system becomes global, all the countries will want to change um, the, the, their laws to be able to be included in that because the efficiency you get from that is, is, oh, yes. is huge. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But now your digital, uh, digital race, your digital currency, DREX, uh, is that offered? Is that a project of the central bank? And if so, if the, if the digital currency is going to be a central bank digital currency, how does the public access it? Again, through banks like PIX? Yes, you can, op you can access through banks. It is a project of the central bank. But this is the project that the banks are participating in the most because for the banks, it's very interesting to be able to issue tokens based on deposits. So a lot, I would say a huge part of this project is actually funded by banks. What we do is we set up the standards and we tell banks, this is the way we think it should work. And we guarantee the, we guarantee the money in the same way that we guarantee the deposits. And today we have in the central bank a layer of uh, settlement for deposits we just build a digital layer on the top of that to settle the digital deposit. So it's very easy compared to, uh, compared to what it would look like to create a digital currency from zero. Yeah, but in simple terms, the public will not have 
a bank account at the central bank. No, 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 no. no. This will, again, this is yeah, all. Yeah, this is very, all, it's very important, very clear. There is not going to be a, central, uh, a bank account in the central bank. There is not going to be a privacy issue because the, the, uh, the, the, the currency is nothing but a tokenized deposit. So it's based on a deposit that people already have on the bank. And when you talked about token, uh, trans, uh, tokenization, that means that the transactions will be transacting tokens or is the underlying yeah. deposit will remain stable? Yeah, exactly. It will be um, transacted on a DLT platform. We chose one that's called Hyperledger Bezel. I can go on a little bit more explaining how the nodes work and the Oracle, but I think it would be highly technical. If yeah. you want, I can do that. Yeah. And also we can explain how we want to have different layers so that you protect privacy when you do the transactions. But that would be more technical, but I can do that if you want to. Well, I think a, a, a question here is, this sounds, this is a very sophisticated yeah. system that you're headed for. Uh, is it going to be too hard for the average citizen to understand and use? Or no. can it be designed in a way that it will, the efficiencies will actually benefit the average user? So the idea is that the journey for the person who uses is very easy, just like Pix. So Pix is a very easy journey. You go into there, and the way Pix was constructed was that if you have a cell phone and you want to transfer money to someone, you need the key. But if that key is in your cell phone, in your agenda, either because it's a number ID number or because a cell phone of anybody, what the system does is it compares the agenda of your phone to a, to a center of data that we have in the central bank. And when we have a match, it automatically identifies that that person has that key and it makes it very easy for you because you don't want to type a lot of numbers uh, in PIX. You just go there and you press PIX and eventually you're going to be able to get from your agenda if that is a key or not. And then you just press transfer and you go. So the idea was to make as user-friendly as possible. The same with uh, Drex. So we're going to be able to go there and, and, and get a token uh, from the bank uh, in the system. I showed an idea of how you can transfer from one to the other. And I think in the beginning, people would like to use the Drex to pay for things that you have to do contracts or registration because it becomes costless. Uh, it becomes much more transparent. And it's very safe because it's there in a platform. You bought that asset and so on and so forth. I always use the example of also of used cards. So in Brazil, this always a, it's a very common example used in Brazil. So you buy a used car for that store on the corner and you don't really trust the guy. So you don't want to send the money before getting the paper signed. The guy doesn't want to sign the paper before seeing the money in his account. So you have this problem. This is all solved at, at zero cost. That's quite the... Uh, quite... Plus, there is one thing. Imagine you, you bought a piece of real estate and you want to get money on your real estate. You can do auctions on the marketplace. You can do auctions based on your collateral. And the other banks will be able to bid for that collateral in exchange for a transaction. It's, it's at this point that heads start spinning, I think, in okay. the audience. But <laughs> the, uh, let's venture into, into economic policy mm -hmm. and its link to this, which is you're uh, the head of the central bank of a country that traditionally had an underdeveloped financial system, underbanked population. Mm -hmm. And uh, now what you're proposing and starting to develop is something that is as sophisticated as exists anywhere in the world. Okay. What, yeah. are the, what do you see as the economic policy benefits of this development? So what, a, what is the incentive? Why are you doing this? It's a very important question. I would say we are underbanked for sure. I'm not so sure that we are less developed because countries have, have very high inflation. Yeah. What happens through time is the banks developed a lot of mechanisms to right. protect people from inflation. Yeah. So when you think about a Brazilian bank for a long time now, it's been much more uh, technical uh, in terms of the way you transfer money, you see your accounts than, for example, banks in other places like the US. And that's out of a necessity of protecting people from inflation. So that's one thing. Um, now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we have we look at the future of financial intermediation and we understand that everything in credit and banking is about asymmetry of information. So if I have less information about you, 
I'll probably have to charge you more for products, for lending. And so what, what the technology does is it's able to reduce the asymmetric information to an extent that one, um, the products and, and the interactions become cheaper, more efficient and faster. And also you can include more people because I cannot have, I cannot afford to have someone looking at the credit, credit of someone who has very little ticket. But if it's all uh, digital, then the cost of uh, serving a client becomes very low. And so that's why we have the inclusion. It's about the cost of, of services for a client. When you are able to lower there, you can include more people and still be profitable. Can I venture one more step, which is sure. uh, this sounds like a system that will make markets much richer, much more profound, not just financial markets, but other transactions as you've described. Is this a, one, one way that uh, financial policy can improve productivity in Brazil's economy? Or is yeah. that claiming too much? No, that's a very good question. The other day, someone asked me, you know, um, what is the effect of peaks and everything that you're doing in terms of growth and productivity? And we, we haven't thought about yet because we're so busy trying to develop the other <laughs> blocks. We haven't thought about that yet, but I'm sure that it, it's very positive because when you think that 12 million bank accounts were created, we have more than 1 billion new business, 1 million new business is just created out of that. And when you look at the, at the friction of transferring money, the cost has reduced so much. I think that has created a lot of efficiency. We don't know, we haven't measured, but we think this is just the beginning because we're still at the peak. So when you look at, for example, at the open finance and you see that you have the potential for these marketplaces of finance, I think the efficiency that you can get into the economy is, is very big, but we haven't measured. And you need to take care for financial stability issues, yes, of course. Yes. But I know you've, you've thought of that. Well, as you can tell, this is very interesting. We could go on, but now it's time to turn to the audience. And okay. the governor has very magnanimously said, he, you can ask him anything about, about anything. You control the questions. Exactly. I, and we, I control the answers. He controls the answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, right here in front. Let's just start. Tara Hariharan, NWI. Governor Campos, lovely to see you again. Um, now, moving from digital payments to the Brazilian real itself. Mm -hmm. um, Brazil is right now benefiting from commodity prices going up, obviously also as an, uh, an oil exporter. And of course, as an uh, award-winning central banker, your uh, policies, the BCV's policies have kept nominal and real rates high in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Given all of these fundamentals, um, what exactly explains why the real is relatively weak? Well, it, it's relatively weak. On, on a very short term. If you look at the more medium term, we are always performing equal or better than, than its peers. Um, and I think it has to do with the fact that um, now we are repricing uh, fiscal equilibrium globally. And the problem when you're repricing that is that something that people didn't pay attention before, which was the fiscal element, now is the focus of the debate. I was in the, in the earlier debate, Harry was there, and I think just about everybody mentioned the word fiscal or some kind of development regarding the fiscal. So the problem right now is that uh, what we're seeing is um, the fiscal is, is going to come into play again. And it's the reality in the US, in Europe, in Japan, and in most emerging market countries. And Brazil has a high debt and is dealing with uh, a plan that tries to, uh, to, to convey to people that you know, we are serious about the fiscal path that we are creating. But because our fiscal numbers, especially when you look at the debt to GDP, um, are, 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 are higher, uh, I think when fiscal comes into play, it becomes more fragile. But I think that a lot of it is short-term movement. Uh, it has to do with also the markets. It has to do with the fact that Brazil is more liquid and we had a repricing of the FX play globally. And when that happens, Brazil has a bit of a higher beta because it's more liquid. So we're seeing some of that too. Um, but I, I would say that when you look at the trade balance, Brazil is definitely stronger than it was in the past. So we have been able to, in, the, in terms of food production, have been able to increase the production with the same land usage, uh, which means that you see a lot of uh, uh, increasing productivity in the agricultural sector. In the oil part, we are becoming more and more active and becoming a bigger play globally. And in the mining part, also Brazil plays a very important part. 
So I think that when we add all the, that up, uh, we see that we have a trade balance that today, in the past, when it was 30 billion, it was like considered very good. Now, if you say it's going to be 80 billion, people say, oh, it could be better. So we are changing the level in, in that sense. So I think that overall makes uh, the currency more stable. But yes, now we are going through this phase of repricing of assets. And I think Brazil is suffering a little bit because of the fiscal dimension uh, of the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Very interesting remarks. Uh, I'm Paul Scachillis from the World Free Program, just speaking on my own behalf. I want to ask you a little bit on the de-dollarization and the idea of BRICS currencies. You mentioned it in your presentation, but in your opinion, um, do you think this will take ho hold over time? And also, in your opinion, from the pr perspective of Brazil or a country like that, what's driving the desire for de-dollarization, in, in your opinion? Thank you. To, to be honest with you, I think this issue is less interesting than it seems. Because if you believe that we are moving into a system of transfers and payments that can be instant amongst different countries, the currency itself loses value. Because one of the things that, like when you, when you talk to economists, one of the things about having a common area or having a single currency or a common currency is because you reduce a lot of friction in trade and you improve uh, the relationship when you exchange values or assets in these companies, in these countries. Now, if you believe that everything is going to be, or at least bigger part of it is going to be uh, electronic, it's going to be electronically transferred to a platform, uh, and it's going to be in a format of token, the currency itself doesn't matter too much anymore because you're going to have immediate convertibility of all the currencies. So I think that issue becomes less interest than actually people make it. And that's, that's my, my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, Mike Darren of Importum, also a size grad, so glad you're up there. <laughs> um, you talked about the inter internationalization of PICS and, and the work you're doing with the governor of the, the Bank of Italy. Um, I'm curious if you could talk about kind of that's further down the road, but if you go to Punta de Este or to mm -hmm. Argentina at this point, you can pay with PIX yeah. um, in a lot of places. How is that uh, um, from a, both your relationship with your counterparts at BCRA or, or in Uruguay or elsewhere, and also on AML, how are you guys addressing that, that you're not having those leakages? Okay, so what we have today is people can pay PIX in different places. Even in Paris, people can pay PIX. But those are companies that are actually acting as intermediary. So they have a bank account in Brazil. You can do picks and they transfer the money and they take the, the settlement risk against payment. This is happening in many countries already. Now, we have, what we have done in the case of Latin America is we said uh, we are going to open the source of picks for any central bank that wants to come here and copy. So uh, last year, we had this period of time in which we had visit of many central banks. And we can open the coding and everything for anybody. And a lot of countries in Latin America said, you know, we actually want to adopt PICS. And we are in conversation with many countries, and, and they're very interesting. Uh, but if they don't want to adopt PICS and they want to adopt another payment system, uh, we also work in a solution to connect those because, you know, maybe they can have a different idea that works uh, better for them. And we can connect them because at the end, the solution to connect the systems um, Again, if you solve the governance issue, I think we can advance on those very fast. Mm -hmm. We have a question from online. We'll take our next question from Arturo Porzkanski. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you. Um, uh, the, the ink on the fiscal rule is barely dry, and it seems like the uh, Lula administration is already seeking to uh, change it, uh, to loosen it. Uh, to what extent uh, could this affect the path of monetary policy? <laughs> <laughs> now the, the hard questions begin to come. Uh, so uh, Arturo, the, the, the central banks, they try to refrain from uh, commenting on fiscal policy as, as much as we can. Um, but obviously there was an effect, I think, uh, and I think it's becoming clear. And even in the US, uh, we've seen uh, comments from um, the, the central banker in regards to that. This obviously makes our job a lot more difficult. 
if there is a perception that uh, there is no fiscal anchor, because the fiscal anchor and the monetary anchor, they have to work together. So whenever you have a change in the government that, fa that makes the fiscal anchor less transparent or less believable, it means that you have to pay with higher costs on the other side. So the cost of doing monetary policy becomes uh, higher. Uh, that being said, um, the market had a much worse number for the fiscal than actually what, the, what was the, the new target that was adopted. But I have been saying for a long time, and I, keep, and I continue to say that, that the ideal is not to change uh, the targets and, and to make sure that you do the most you can in terms of effort to achieve, to achieve this target. And if you, be, if you, if you for some reason, um, have to make a detour on that, uh, it's very important to communicate well, because if people lose trust on the fiscal an anchor, then the monetary anchor uh, is affected. And we have seen that repeatedly in our history. Right here in front. Hi, Vanessa Gomez for Standard Chartered. And um, Governor, it's truly remarkable the work you have done in Brazil. And as a Brazilian citizen, I'm really proud. Um, but I would just would like to make a question on PICS again. Uh, it's really uh, phenomenal, the adherence of the system in Brazil and how easy and how it has reduced, reduced friction. But what about the, the, the risks associated with crime and uh, frauds that have been growing a lot associated to that? So how is the central bank uh, looking at those risks, mitigating and working with other banks mm -hmm. in this issue? Thank you. That, that's a very good question. Um, at the end, when you think about the system that is traceable and that is digital and is account-based, the result of, from that should be that the fraud diminishes, not increases. Uh, and sometimes you see that the number, uh, the fraud has increased, but you don't take into consideration that you had a lot of other kinds of transactions that are not uh, taking place anymore. And on those, you had a much higher uh, rate of fraud. But if you think in a perfect system in which you have no fake bank accounts, you have no uh, what we call passage bank accounts, so if you're able to do know your client and make sure that every account actually belongs to the person that uh, actually is a real person and, and responds for it, then the crime goes almost to zero. Because that would mean if I have to do a fraud on PIX on you, I had to transfer money from your account to mine. And people will know that the account is mine. They will know my address, my phone number, and I will be caught immediately. So what we need to work right now is to make sure that these fake accounts don't exist. So what, we, what we're doing is increasing the surveillance, on, the surveillance on the banks to make sure that um, the system in which people open accounts are safer than what they are now. Because if you think in a perfect world, if we eliminate this transaction, this passage accounts, then the fraud will go to zero because I, I'm not going to steal money from you and transfer to my own account because people will know it's me. So this is what we're working now. But I think at the end, the system is safer uh, than the one that we had before. Mm -hmm. Eric. Name is Hari Haran. Governor, one somewhat emotional issue right now in global markets is the US-led proposal to, in some intelligent fashion, securitize income on Russian assets, which have been frozen, to pay for Ukraine reconstruction. Now, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know any comments on the morality or the nobleness of the project. The question basically is very simple. You, as a big central bank with a large foreign exchange reserve, what would your advice be to the advanced economies about the pros and cons of doing this? Yeah, that that is a very tricky question, and uh, it's it's uh, it involves uh, external politics. But I would say that uh, for countries. They have high reserves and invest the, invest the reserves abroad in different places, like in accounts in BIS and so on and so forth. Um, I think the moral hazard that can be created by that, uh, I think far, uh, uh, far exceed the benefits uh, from actually uh, using that uh, to serve as, as a policy sign. So I would, I would think that um, 
people need to understand that the whole system is based on the trust that once you accumulate reserve and invest abroad, you can get your money when you need it to. So I'm not uh, suggesting anything. I'm just saying as a central banker who has a reserves invested in different places, uh, I worry that you can break this trust link and, and then the whole financial system is based uh, on how you, um, uh, you accumulate assets and where you deposit your assets. So I think it's a, it's a dangerous proposition. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Rory McFarker. I'm from an investment fund called Gemshot. Um, your term is coming to a close. Um, could you comment on the succession process and the degree to which you're expecting continuity or change, both on the monetary policy side and on the whole digital agenda that you've laid out today? Okay, uh, good question. So um, I fought a lot for the operational autonomy of the central bank. It was a very hard fight. We had to go to Congress was difficult in Congress, was difficult in the Senate. Then it was judicialized, so we had to go to the Supreme Court and I had to talk to people in the Supreme Court. And it was a very, very difficult fight. Uh, but we were able to get it. And what it says there is that uh, it is the prerogative of the president to choose the directors changing two every year and to choose the president of the central bank. So I've decided because of that, and that doesn't make sense for me, to try to interfere in the process or to um, say whether the candidate A or B or C is better. I think you know, what the law says is the prerogative of the president, and he will have um, the liberty to do that and also pay the price uh, if, the, the, if the option is not good. And, you know, this is how the system works. And I, I fought this for this, for this uh, very much. Uh, but I, I have to say that the central bank is highly technical, and a lot of the work is done by the technical teams. And the agenda of innovation was there when I got there. It was uh, created by Elon, which was my predecessor, which, which was an excellent president of the central bank, left the bar very high for me. And, um, you know, what I tried, and, he, and, and the passage between Elon and myself was very smooth. We worked together for like a month, a month and a half. And I think the best thing I can do right now is to do the same. So try not to interfere. I understand that this is a prerogative of the government and, Regardless of who is uh, who is chosen, I'll try to to make a, a smooth transaction, work with him. Um, and uh, again, I, I don't see a lot of changes because I think the central bank is very technical. The central bank has a clear mandate. Um, I think the, the the autonomy of the central bank gives power to someone who sits in the chair to be independent of the government. And I hope that this will continue. Thanks. We have another online question. We'll take our next question from Seema Modi. Ms. Modi, please accept the unmute now prompt. Looks like we're having technical difficulties with that line. We'll take the next question from Professor Okome. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I am wondering the extent to which there is interaction between Brazil and the BRICS countries in terms of coordination um, of these innovations. Then I also wonder if one were on the streets of Brazil and I asked a banker and a business person and just an ordinary person on the street how are these innovations working out? What would they say? Okay. So the first part of the question was regarding uh, BRICS. And BRICS has new members, and we've had a couple of meetings with the new members, and we are talking about um, doing systems and, and transferring money. Ob obviously, when you have countries that are sanctioning within a group, uh, makes some of the process much more difficult than it used to be in the past. Uh, and we're trying to see, given the limitations, what we can do. And regarding asking people on the streets, I think people will tell you that um, PIX has actually uh, opened a lot of doors for them. And I get that a lot. Uh, so I'll give you a, an example. There is a small uh, city. I, I've, I've given this example before. 
It's a small city called Tartarugalzinho, uh, which is a, a very small city in, in, in a small state. And they didn't have bank accounts. They didn't have bank branches and they didn't have ATMs. They had nothing. So the way people pay their bills is someone would go there in the city in the beginning of the day, get the bills and go to a different city to pay the bills. They'll charge for that. And the whole city now works on PICS. And I got a video from a woman that lives in the city saying that she created the, this small business and the business is only, was only able to be created because of PICS. And now the PICS has you know, different business. You have people selling things and so you can actually uh, see how a simple thing that, that was created by the central bank, which, by the way, costed like $3 million, mm -hmm. can change you know, the life of people uh, around and, and how can you include new people and new business. Uh, so I think the reaction from people would be very positive. In the back there, Time for one more. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Drazo Giacomelli, Deutsche Bank. This has been a very unusual time for monetary policy. <laughs> Inflation accelerates into the cycle, labor markets get tighter, etc. cetera. And um, historically in Brazil, you, um, central banks had to hike rates when current account deficits <coughs> were wide and interest rates in the US could go up. Right? So we, historically, we had to defend the currency. But as you said, the balance of payments in Brazil is great. The um, situation is quite solid. But still, the market's pricing out all your easing. Mm -hmm. So the question is, uh, do you see fiscal deficits as the new current account deficits of the past? OK, so the, the first part of the question is on the, on the repricing. And uh, when you look at what's happening in the US, for, for some period of time, people were thinking that the, the rate cuts would start in March. And when that disappoints, basically, you had that effect of a window moving through time, which means that you actually changed the window, but you didn't change the terminal rate until a point more recently in which uh, data now disappoints. And then not only people change the window, but now you have an effect on the terminal rate. When you started to have an effect on the terminal rate on the US, you basically had an effect in terminal rate of many countries. Uh, it's not by coincidence, the last time I saw the pricing uh, of cuts in many different countries, all, all of them had the same, which is exactly the one in the US, which is 100 base. Now it's, it has changed. That was like two weeks ago. Um, and so it means that to some extent, um, a lot of the expectations in terms of where terminal rates are, are connected. The, uh, that goes back into the argument of, you know, what is the effect of the monetary policy in the US um, to other countries? Um, but I think a lot of this cycle, uh, obviously you're not going to change completely, but the cycle has changed to some extent. Some of these economies have become less sensitive to what happens in new rates in the US, but obviously you had a huge repricing and that has an effect. I think the, the, the thing to watch here, which I think probably will become the next big issue, uh, is I think we are in for a debate on the global debt. And the fact that you are now um, postponing uh, the, the cycle, but you also have a higher terminal rate, I think will make people talk about the debt. So if you look at the biggest blocks of advanced economies, just look at uh, US, Europe, and Japan, just for an example. Um, the total debt of these three blocks, sovereign debt, is a very, very, it's a huge proportion of the total debt, debt out there. If you look at the fact that they used to pay close to 1% to roll over the debt, and now it's going to three, that's three times more. So on the biggest debt in the planet, you have a cost of serving the debt that, went time, well, that is up three times, threefold. Plus, on the top of that, you increase the debt of this block by 25% of GDP. So I think the next topic that we'll be talking uh, in, in a while, uh, it's not about the window of inflation. I think that was the topic that we, and we talked about that last year when, when nobody was talking about that. And we mentioned that we, we, we didn't see the, the disinflation process as smooth as some other people said. But now I think you've passed that. I think now you're pricing to some extent that the cycle will, uh, will, will delay a little bit. But now the next issue is what happens to the total debt? And it's funny because you look around and um, the fiscal is becoming much less and less coordinated with the monetary. And it's funny because when we got into the, the pandemic, 
was very easy to coordinate, right? You increase spending and you slash rates. So on the way in, it was very easy to coordinate. Guess what? On the way out, it's been very difficult to coordinate. And there is nothing more permanent than a temporary program of expenditure. <laughs> That's, uh, that was a, a, I stole from Milton Friedman. <laughs> but but, but uh, you've seen that in many different places, and I think this will become an issue. So I think that's, the, cent the, the for me, the most important point. Well, on that cheery note, <laughs> uh, I think it's uh, we've come to the end of this session. I think it's been a terrific session, very, very stimulating in so many ways. There's still lots of topics we could talk about. And so I would end by saying, number one, I hope that you'll return and become the not only the first governor <laughs> of the Central Bank of Brazil to speak at the council, but the first to do it twice. Thank you so much. Secondly, thanks, thanks for joining the meeting. <laughs> thanks, Governor. <laughs> and I suspect everybody can see why you were named Central Banker oh, of the you. Year. Thanks thank for coming. Thank you.